wonderful, wonderful service so far. I want to give you an update on my wife, and I appreciate the meals that have been provided, all the cards and text messages, and all the way uh, from last week. She had surgery for a herniated disc on her back. She had a sciatic that had been bothering her for the better part of a year or so, and uh, she had surgery on Tuesday, and uh, she went home on Wednesday, and is, uh, would have been here this morning uh, had I not stopped her. I think she was just uh, ready to get going. It's hard to turn it on and turn it off when you're so used to being a type A at the church. So, uh, Lord willing, she may make it back tonight. We'll see. But she's recovering nicely and uh, doing well. She's got her Fitbit on and is trying to walk a lot. And I think she got 4,000, 5,000 steps in yesterday. So that's good. The doctor said to, not to run, but to do a lot of walking and that type of thing. So uh, if you would uh, continue to pray for her and uh, pray for me because I have to do some things around the house I have never done. And, uh, um, you know, certain things. No, I, I generally help her out, but it's uh, laundry and things like that. It's just something that, you know, we need to we need to all work on. So we'll see as the Lord leads. But I uh, hope you have your Bibles with you. We're into the uh, gospel according to Matthew. We're going to spend a week on each of the Beatitudes. We will not spend uh, quite as long on the rest of the text as we go through. But this particular text is incredibly important. It's really Jesus's first uh, public preaching time. I know back at uh, up in Nazareth, he had one short message in the temple there. But this is his first uh, introduction to the public. And he gives this message we call the Sermon on the Mount. And he introduced the Sermon on the Mount. He comes up with the Beatitudes. Now, the Beatitudes are the blessings, or happy, if you want to call it that, the happiness verses. But he calls blessed. The first two Beatitudes are what we call prerequisites for being a Christian, discipleship, excuse me, for being a Christian. We find blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are those that mourn. And we covered those somewhat extensively regarding salvation, regarding becoming a Christian, accepting Christ by faith, coming to the end of your rope and understanding that it's all God's grace, it's nothing I can do, it's everything He has already done for me. And we find that in the first two of the Beatitudes there, verses number 3 and verses number 4. Now, don't miss this. Verses number 5 all the way to the end. Now, this is pretty interesting. If you understand and get a hold of those two Beatitudes, this ought to come out of your life naturally. This is a result. It's a manifestation, if you want to call it, of being a Christian. And he says that in verse number 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then really best at 10, 11, and 12 are the same particular event being uh, regarding persecution. But we find in verse number 5 something that we may seem out of order a little bit. It doesn't seem right to the audience that was hearing it and to you today. Blessed are the, let's say it together, meek. For they shall inherit the earth. I want to preach a message I simply titled this morning, Blessed are the meek. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do pray that this message would resonate in all our lives. No doubt about it. There's change needed today. No doubt about it. The issue of biblical meekness needs to permeate the families, the homes, the lives of Christians. It says, Lord, that we will be happy if we're meek. An inheritance will be your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Allow me to preach a message that honors you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. The first two, as I said, were toward God and salvation. The next Beatitudes are how we treat each other 
in many cases. Our, re our reaction to it. But to understand the, what was going on here, we must start to understand the audience that this message was being spoken to. The application back then. The audience was primarily Jewish. Matthew was written, was a penned. It's the gospel record, the first of the gospel records as far as the order. Not the first in recording, but the first in the order. As Matthew was written primarily to a Jewish audience to show them that Jesus was the Messiah and he was the king of the Jews. And so that being said, that's why some of the language here would resonate with those in the audience. This was the start of Jesus' ministry. A dynamic point would be made about the radical difference between Jesus' message and the religion of that day. He had to start off with a bang. And buddy, let me tell you, this was a bang. And we talk about the subject of meekness. What is meekness? Well, there's many ways to biblically define, which we will proof text this today. But one of the ways to look at meekness, it's a calm temper of mind, not easily provoked. And we will walk through this and define that in more detail. It's also a moral quality of humility and gentleness. Usually, and we find this in the text when the word meek is used, it's exhibited during suffering or difficulty. And it's accompanied by the faith in God. Now we find the opposite of meekness is harshness, proud, wickedness, that insists on immediate self-vindication. So we have a dynamic difference between biblical meekness and the way we want to react. Proverbs 16, 19 says this, says, Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. James 1, 3, 13 says this, Who is a wise man, wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. So we're looking at the subject of meekness. It's usually in the Bible when you find the subject of meekness, you can almost 100% of the time find some form of opposition going against that individual, or in this case, Christianity. They were special objects of God's divine regard, especially when you look at people like David when he was being chased by Absalom and by King Saul. Turn to Proverbs 22 real quickly. Proverbs 22. It's the opposite of the way you and I want to react. Especially when there's opposition. Meek? Are you kidding me? It says in Proverbs 22, look at verse 26, please. The meek, 22, Psalms 22, 26. I think that's what I told you. I said Proverbs, I'm serious, Psalms 22, 26. The meek shall eat and be what? Satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. In Psalm 37, 11, it says, but the meek shall inherit the earth. That's what he's talking about here. And ladies and gentlemen, when we look at the subject of meekness, it's an attitude of humility, submissive, and expected trusting in God. Our audience is so turned off by the lack of meekness in Christians. Gentle, patient, the King James used a, a word for patience that I really love. It's called long-suffering. 
Do you like that? That really kind of explains patience. Long-suffering. In other words, you've got to endure it a long time. Gentle in patience. So let's look at meekness explained. Go to Matthew chapter 11, please. And let's look at Jesus Christ to explain meekness. We all know people that explode, that blow up. They want to give you a piece of their mind. They want to vindicate themselves through harsh words or attitudes or, excuse me, look here, sometimes even actions. That's why we lose our audience sometimes. Dr. John MacArthur explained when the entire issue of gay marriage came up four years ago. And Christians were rightly, rightly, extremely upset about it. Rightfully so. And he did a survey of a lot of the way Christians were handled it. And he says they have the right doctrine but the wrong spirit. And he said a term that I give him credit for creating, and I've used it many times, ladies and gentlemen, we have made the mission field our enemy. And I want to tell you one of the single biggest reasons that happens is what you see on that screen is not exhibited by many Christians. I'm not saying if we all rock around meek, I'm not saying to lay down your doctrine, to lay down your convictions or anything like that. But how do you handle, excuse me, life? See, Jesus was the personification of meekness. Look what it says there in chapter 11, verse number 29. He's talking about himself. Take my yoke upon you and learn of who? Me. That's Jesus. For I am what? Meek. Hello? That's Christ. And lowly in heart you shall find rest unto your soul. Now to many when we look at the word meekness we think of passivity, somebody passive, a spineless person. Someone who's easily imposed on. That is not the biblical definition of meekness. Meekness can be said it's strength under control. Maybe that's a better way to define it. Nothing can be further from the truth. Meekness does not suggest weakness. Rather, it denotes strength brought under control. In other words, you have strength, but it's under control and guided by God's word and God in your life. In a biblical sense, being meek describes one who has channeled his strengths into the service of God. I've heard when I was growing up, not many times, I wasn't brought to that type of a church, but in certain cases, certain people defending biblical values in a way that was not meek. And when people were offended, it's almost like they got excited about getting a pound of flesh. See, by nature, ladies and gentlemen, look here. We're volatile. We're temperamental. And as one writer says, we're gruff. Not sure exactly what that means, but I wrote it down. <laughs> But if we take Christ's spirit upon us, we're to be meek and gentle. And that means you're going to get run over. It doesn't mean that you don't stand your ground. We love to quote Jude where it says, we must contend, earnestly contend for the faith. We're not talking about laying down faith or doctrine or various 
biblical commands we should die over. Let me say this to your kids. See meekness in a mom and dad. Your children, do your parents see meekness in a teenager? And let me bring it a little closer to home. Do you see meekness in your pastor and his wife? Very convicting. This is the type of service that we all should bow our heads, close our eyes, and weep and beg for forgiveness. Because there's not a person in this room that has not caused some heartache because your lack of self-control and meekness. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, please. 1 Peter chapter 3. I shared with our parenting class this morning one of the qualities of a parent that I exuberates biblical compassion is the willingness to apologize. I, uh, I won't go through it, but I had one of my children. I thought I was a little rough with him or her. And uh, years later, I said, you know, dad and primarily dad, dad and mom didn't handle that right. We didn't listen to the other side. How many of you have ever apologized for anything? I want to go to my grave. I want to leave this church one day. Not as a great orator, not necessarily as even a great pastor, but a man that lived by faith, loved people, and I didn't leave a list of things unsettled. There is happiness, look here, with that. There's joy with that. Peter writes to a persecuted church, he says, But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Now, he doesn't say retaliate, does he? Post on Facebook how wicked they are. Give them a tweet and say, that's not what God's word says. Doesn't say that, does he? And be not afraid of their terror. Do you see that? By the way, we have the truth. I'm not afraid of the truth. I'm not afraid of the Bible. I know what the Bible says. I'm not afraid of truth. I know what God's word says. And I don't need to explode and blow up at people because they don't necessarily follow the Bible as it's clearly outlined. Neither be troubled. And verse number 15 is interesting, but sanctify or set apart the Lord God in your hearts. Because guess what? If you handle this right, this is so good. This is one of those little jewels in the Bible. If you handle this right, be ready because they are going to ask for an answer. To every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with what? Meekness and fear. They've seen that. Mr. So-and-so, I've seen how you've handled this. Can you tell me about your relationship with God? And Peter is in a persecuted church. If you study the, ep- the epistle of 1 Peter, I mean, it is really bad. There is all kind of persecution going on from death to mayhem. And he is saying here, if you're suffering for righteousness sake, happy are ye. See, meekness is an attribute that comes during persecution. It's grace under fire. 
The disciples are dying a martyr's death. All of them but one died a martyr's death that we know of. It's not exploding. It's not giving somebody a piece of your mind. It's not vengeance or retribution. It's not yelling at your kids. It's disciplining them. And I believe we find in verse number 5 of this particular text, the Beatitudes, this is a byproduct of the first two Beatitudes. I had a man one time years ago, years ago, more than 12 years ago, came to my office. And he said the following statement. That's just the way God made me. And he actually had almost punched a guy out at the car wash. Kicked in his light of his car. And I go, please don't tell me you go to work. Did he follow you here? <laughs> and then he went on to witness to people at his church and wonder why nobody wanted his God. It's not optional. Let's read the text. It's not something we can decide we don't want. The fruit of the Spirit is. Do you see that? Is. That means there's a list coming. You might want to put a coal in there if you wanted to. The fruit of the Spirit is. I like to list things. Love, right? Joy. Peace. Long-suffering. I love that gentleness, goodness, faith, that, works, that is the next 23, that's not, the fruit of the Spirit is 23, <laughs> meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. It's not an option. Galatians 6, 1 says this, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, this is restoring somebody who has sinned. Let's let God's word speak for itself. I'll read it alone, but let it convict you and me. It says here, which ye which are what? Can we say this together? Spiritual? Restore such a one in the spirit of what? Why? Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Years ago, years ago, had a man that left our church because I wouldn't discipline a man that he thought did such and such. He was the guardian of truth in the church. I'm just being sarcastic. And he says, you need to discipline this. And he was always pointing his finger at people. And I says, you know, you better stop pointing your finger at people because one day you're going to point it back at yourself. Can I tell you, that man, the very thing he wanted somebody church disciplined over, fell into that sin. I think of this verse. See, gentleness is the opposite of being self-assertive or meekness, self-interest. The opposite of that. We find in Ephesians 4, 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, we're to forbear our one another. In other words, to be meek, you have to have self-control under pressure. Do your children walk around on eggshells waiting for you to explode? Does your wife or husband know what button if they push it, it's gonna, everything is going to come unglued? Philippians 2, 3 says this, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. And we find from Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, this is not an option. I'm not saying it's easy. A well-known preacher was walking with his son. A man approached him and started talking to the preacher. At one point, the man asked the preacher's opinion 
of another man that had been at great odds with him. Remember, this is in front of his son. The preacher said something along the lines, I think he's a good man. Not long after that man went away, once the father and son were alone again, the son looked up at his dad and said, I thought that man hated you and couldn't stand you. Why did you say such a thing about him? And the preacher said, because I wasn't asked what his opinion was of me, I was asked what my opinion was of him. That's an example of meekness. See, many people think meekness is weakness, but it could not be further from the truth. Meekness is controlled with strength. A horse hasn't lost its strength when it gets harnessed. It's gained usefulness. It's not lost one ounce of strength. We choose to direct our power to be constructive or destructive. A missionary in Jamaica, let me give you another quote, said this. He was quoting a little boy and regarding Matthew 5.5. 5. Who are the meek? He asked the boys this in his Bible class. The boy answered and said, those who give soft answers to rough questions. Wow. The next one, meekness and inheritance. We'll land the plane with this one. Go back to our text, please, Matthew 5. There's something added on to the end there that I believe, not added on, but something that Blessed are, for they get X. And the X there is they shall inherit the earth. Now, you've got to remember, the audience here was Jewish. The audience was who Jesus was speaking to. And we can actually apply this today as well, no doubt about it. And when they talked about inheriting the earth, the first thing that came to their mind was entrance into the promised land. Heaven. If you want to speak that. And the connotation for those that were hearing Jesus Christ speak. And those that are meek will gain the promised land. The promised land for us in New Testament terms would be heaven. We're not looking for the promised land. Pennsylvania is not the promised land. Especially in January and February. Amen. Right? I saw something the other day. It was posted on the social media. It was kind of funny. It says... Spring, and it showed flowers, and it showed gardens, and it showed April showers bring May flowers. March comes in like a lion and out like a lamb, blah, 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 blah. And then it showed Erie, and it had a guy with his lawnmower mowing snow. <laughs> oh, my. Can I relate to that? I remember last year, I think we, the spikers were, we were over helping around the team area. And it was our work day. It was a w two weeks before the race. So it was mid-May. My hands are frozen. It's raining. And I'm going, this is mid-May. Tell me why I live here, you know. <laughs> so it's all because of love for you. Oh, Pastor. <laughs> hey, smile. It's okay to smile, <laughs> But we find here its entrance into what we call the promised land. If a meek spirit gives you the right to claim heaven as your home, it doesn't mean it's a requirement. It's not some legalistic tendency we list for salvation. But I need encouragement. Here's what I mean. The greatest encouragement you can have is to look forward to something that's excited, right? Let's say you're going on vacation. Let me give you an example. My daughter and, and my son-in-law, they're flying down to Brazil uh, to see the in-laws. They're all excited about this and blah, blah, blah. And they're going to have spent a week or two down or a week or so down there. And they're getting excited. And it really excites them. We talked to my granddaughter last night. And, you know, do you know Portuguese? And she didn't know what Portuguese is, but she knows she's going somewhere. She said, Daddy, she said to my wife, it's so cute. She says, we're going to go from one plane to another. We're going to jump off the plane and then land on another one. I said, you're not going to do that midair, I hope. 
But they were so excited because there's something out there that they're looking for the future and it really gets them motivated. And when you're going through persecution and you're having to have a meek spirit, strength under control, he's saying, don't worry about it. Your inheritance isn't here. It's up there. That's what you hold on. This is a quote of Psalm 37, 11, as David writes, but the meek shall inherit the what? Same quote, the earth, and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Christ is confirming the ancient promise that David had spoken. You go all through this messianic psalm, and not all of us call it a messianic psalm. I believe it is. Psalm 37. It's all about inheriting the earth. The righteous shall inherit the land, etc., etc. You find in 37.9, 37.29, 37.34. We find in verse number 5, we're pointing toward heaven. The promised land. The messianic kingdom. Can I say this? And I'm almost done. Meekness and gentleness is a characteristics, characteristic of those we'll find going to heaven. It outflows from us. doesn't mean that we're in sinless perfection. It doesn't mean that you won't mess up time to time. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, The good that I would I do not, the evil that I would not that I do, such as the war that wages within me. Let's close with this, and it's not on the screen. I want you to go to James chapter 1. We'll, we'll land with this one. James writes in verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to what? Say it, please speak. Slow to what? Wrath. Oh, my. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Maybe you need to go home today and get on your hands and knees and get with God. Maybe you need to apologize to somebody. Maybe you need to call somebody. But from this time forward, Can you just take a chill pill? You have the strength, and maybe you're 100% right. But that doesn't negate the fact of how you reacted. Let's all stand with every head bowed and every eye closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do pray, no doubt, if this message didn't resonate with you, I don't know where you've been. We're all guilty. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This, this falls on everybody at least sometime in your life. Maybe your way of being angry is just not to say anything, but shoot darts with your eyes. Whatever it may be, that's not meek either. Just because you didn't verbally enunciate what you're thinking in your heart. Lord, help me have a meek spirit. Strength under control. I pray for this church that we would be a living testimony in our part of the county. That we stand for righteousness, holiness, godliness. But we have a meek spirit. Open the windows of heaven. 
Lord Jesus.